Uh, thank you so much for having me in Tel Aviv. This is my first time in Israel. I live in San Francisco, so. <laughs> And as uh, Sergey mentioned, I am the lead designer on the team at Salesforce known as Design Systems, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Uh, we are a publicly traded company, so I'm required to share this statement with you. Let me know when you're done reading, and I'll wait. Uh, no? Okay. Um, <laughs> no, basically the gist is um, don't make any purchasing decisions based on a design systems talk, because that would be really, really weird. Uh, so let's move on. <laughs> okay. So, um, right now, um, if you've been seeing like all the style guides that have been coming out and everything's being public. Style guides are all the rage right now. And they've come a long way. All right. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Like, we even have like entire websites dedicated to style guides. This is styleguides.io, which was done by Anna Debenham, who's actually in Tel Aviv right now, I'm going to catch up with her later, uh, in collaboration with Brad Frost. Tons of resources there, check it out if you haven't seen it. Uh, my first style guide I did 12 years ago at a design agency known as Odin Marketing and Design. I was an intern, and I was doing my style guides in InDesign and generating PDFs. And as you can imagine, that's not really uh, an efficient way to do things. Uh, fast forward to um, 2007, I was working at Apple. Um, I was doing style guides because I was a front-end developer as well as a uh, UI designer, and I had a lot of documentation and patterns that I needed to document. Back then, I was doing things on WordPress because I was thinking, well, this is going to be a huge improvement from PDFs, and it was, but still was not <laughs> quite efficient. But I was really excited about this idea, and in 2008, I wrote an article about it called Writing an Interface Style Guide for a List Apart. The gist of that article, the too long didn't read, is uh, you know, documenting your brand and design standards, your front end standards, and keeping your uh, style guide current and useful. And that's the really key part that I'm going to focus on, is keeping your style guide current and useful. Um, so, Design systems, you know, I've been saying style guide, but right now the common terminology you might be hearing is design systems. What is a design system? Um, s design systems are not actually a new thing. Uh, they've been around for a very long time. Uh, a few months back, I organized a design systems conference called Clarity in San Francisco, and the keynote speaker was an 84-year-old designer named Richard Daney, who shared his design systems work that he did for NASA back in the 70s. And the system scaled from everything from stationary to uniforms to vehicles uh, to space shuttles, um, which it was kind of cool to hear his story because he was saying even though they've changed their branding since, he has work still floating out in space because let's face it, nobody's going to fly all the way out and change the logo on a space shuttle. <laughs> in 2013, I moved on to my team at Salesforce and I'm going to talk to you about our process. Um, and the reason I want to share our process is because we're doing this at a very large enterprise scale. And I, I think we've learned a couple things, but you know, the, the way we do things might be actually totally different from the way you do things. And that's totally okay. Um, in fact, if you do have a very different way you go about this, I'd love to talk to you later. Um, but I'm gonna share how we did it. So, um, why did Salesforce need a design system? Uh, Salesforce is a really big company. We have offices all over the world. In fact, we have one here in Israel. Um, it's a very large, large uh, pr problem to solve. So product design, I've learned, in an enterprise organization can be tricky. Um, and in the world of what we're doing, um, we're actually dealing with 17 years of legacy, because we've been around for 17 years. And as you can imagine, 17 years ago for web is pretty archaic. And now we've grown to over 20,000 employees. Um, so lots of, excuse me, lots of people involved. We also have a lot of products. I'm not going to read through all these, but we have a lot to consider. You know, we're always, it seems like almost every day we're acquiring a new company. And we want to align our brand across all these products and all these platforms. So things I've learned. <laughs> to design at Salesforce is to consider the whole ecosystem. 
Uh, when I first joined the team uh, a few years ago, uh, we launched Salesforce One, which was our mobile application, which was the first product to bring a more modern, updated look uh, to the UI. And we learned a lot from this process. T uh, the designer developer communication that was uh, mentioned before was um, pretty tricky. Like, we would hear questions all the time, like, where can I find the icons? What color is the button border? Where can I find the icons? And you just hear these same questions over and over and over again. So a common technique that a lot of companies use are what are known as red lines. And if you're not familiar with red lines, that's basically where you specify a design, all the pixel dimensions, font sizes, um, spacing, et cetera. But as you can imagine, on an enterprise scale, this is not a very fun process. And red lines promote designing pages, which for um, you know, enterprise product design or even uh, smaller startup product design is not the way to go about it. So you may or may not have seen the Salesforce One style guide. It's not around anymore because we took it down. But this was out a few years ago. And um, this is actually what I saw that made me want to join the team because I thought it was really cool. I thought it was really beautiful. Um, and it was, and it got a lot of traction. But when we shared it, um, you know, we have a conference in San Francisco called Dreamforce. It's massive. And all these customers and partners come and talk to us. And they kept asking questions like, well, where do, or how do I get my app to look like this? Um, and can I use the CSS in my app? And the reason they were asking us this question is they're often building um, apps that will live inside Salesforce, so it needs to kind of look and feel like it belongs there. Because if it doesn't look like it belongs there, people aren't going to trust it. So we learned that the style guide wasn't really quite solving the problem. And it didn't really give um, our developers an official way to even use it or refer to it. So as you can imagine, it was ignored. And um, it was basically a nice, fancy sh portfolio showpiece that we could share, but it wasn't really practical. So uh, last year, we launched what's known as our Lightning Experience. And this was basically our revamped UI uh, that was not just for our phone, but also for tablets, watches, uh, desktop UI. Um, we're even looking at things like TV, you know, Internet of Things, um, all sorts of things. Um, and in conjunction with uh, launching this UI, we created um, our Lightning Design System. Um, so if you haven't seen it, Check it out later. It's at salesforce.com slash design system. This is the product that I work on um, at Salesforce. It's also open source, so you can check it out. Um, GitHub, uh, salesforce-ux is our repo. Our repos are there. So um, I'm going to use an acronym SLDS. Uh, that means Salesforce Lightning Design System, uh, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we didn't use LDS because we're not Mormons, so we slapped the S on there to kind of distinguish um, our acronym from them. So design systems. This is what we want. Um, but how do we create one of these? How do we design one of these? So again, I'm going to share how we did it. Um, and this is how we did it to scale. So it's important um, from the very beginning, before you even embark on this journey, is to have a clear vision to align efforts. Uh, so at Salesforce, I have a mentor named Craig Billimore. He's the chief design architect. He's been at Salesforce for 10 years. And the thing he often says is the more decisions you put off and the longer you delay them, the more expensive they become. It's really important to make better design decisions as quickly as possible. And to do this properly, um, we found that it's important to drive design decisions with design principles. And this is how you can bring designers, engineers, product managers all around a single goal. And so the design principles that we landed on, um, which I think are applicable for any company, are uh, clarity, which means eliminate ambiguity, uh, enable people to see, understand, and act with confidence. Efficiency, uh, streamline and optimize workflows, intelligently anticipate needs to help people work better, faster, and smarter. Consistency, of course, uh, create familiarity, strengthen intuition by applying the same solution to the same problem, 
In beauty, we want to demonstrate respect for people's time and attention through thoughtful and elegant craftsmanship. So one of the practices that we do on my team, uh, or we all, anytime there's a list of anything, whether it's a list of tasks, a list of goals, a list of design principles, we always try to put those lists in priority order. And so these design principles that I mentioned to you are in a very specific priority order for a very specific reason. <coughs> so number one, clarity. Uh, clarity is core to our experience. Our users need, to clarif uh, need clarity to complete their tasks to reach their goals. And if we can ensure that users are successfully reaching their goals over and over and over, um, then we can earn their trust, their loyalty, and their gratitude. And we found that this was more important for us over everything. Uh, next up is efficiency. And this came up repeatedly as we talked to our customers during our research. And we almost put it at the top uh, because it came up so much. But when we started thinking about like doubling down on efficiency, um, we noticed that there were some drawbacks. Like you can create a lot of design shortcuts for expert users, but then you're forgetting about your beginners. Um, so if we took efficiency to the extreme, new users would be overwhelmed. So um, we don't want them to make mistakes because mistakes are costly. So efficiency came second, clarity being number one. And then consistency. Of course, any talk about design systems, consistency is always brought up. And it is important for us, which is why it's in the list. Um, but for us, we felt that clarity and efficiency are much more important than consistency. Because if something's like consistently bad, you're not really helping your users. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we do pay attention to that. Um, it helps make, make us um, have better quality by being consistent. But clarity and efficiency for us um, outweighed that. Um, so our fourth principle being beauty. Beauty is, of course, important to designers, but it's not the defining characteristic of our product. Um, it's about getting things done. Um, and then design standards comes up a lot when you're talking about design systems and style guides. But we feel very importantly that design principles um, outweigh design standards. They're way more important, and they're how you're going to really make sure that you're doing the right thing. And of course, it's important to evangelize and align within your company. And so at Salesforce, we have posters up with these design principles, and they're hung up all over the office, uh, especially in the UX area. But we've found that uh, our developers, engineers, um, our product managers, like other people are starting to communicate through um, the system as well, which is great. So Luke W. said, uh, design considerations, oh, it's back, yes. Uh, design considerations beat design patterns. Test and decide. Don't just copy things like the hamburger icon. We all like to hate on the hamburger icon, um, and it's for good reason. I think a lot of people saw it, thought it was trendy, put it in their UI, and a lot of apps have pulled it out of their UI because they found that it didn't really work. So it's important to do your research. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the quote by Nathan Curtis that it's a living product. Uh, so you treat your design system as if it were a product. You still do your research. So we interviewed a lot of our users, and these range anywhere from designers, engineers, writers, uh, our partners that are in our ecosystem, face-to-face uh, -face interviews, um, taking lots of notes, asking questions, understanding pain points. Um, so always important to do that first. And then I've also learned that um, from the very beginning, it's important to embrace what your constraints are. Um, so for designers, like sometimes constraints can be very scary. You want to be very creative and have all the room to do whatever you want. Um, but we've found for us that constraints can actually be a catalyst for a different type of creativity. So some of those constraints, which are actually in my uh, mind features, not constraints, are things like accessibility. So um, color contrast is really important to us. Um, things like making sure you're using the component that's proper for that type of interaction. Um, if you're using a modal, once you're in that modal, you're trapped in that modal until you perform the action or get out of that modal. So you have to be careful about where you're applying these types of things. 
Um, at my Clarity conference I mentioned earlier, um, one of the speakers I had was Cordelia McGee-Tubb, who is at Dropbox, um, and she said a really awesome metaphor that I really liked, which was saying, you know, it's like baking a blueberry muffin. If you bake the muffin first, and then f realize, oh, I didn't put the muff, uh, sorry, the blueberries in there, and you cram the blueberries in later, it's gonna be a really crappy muffin. <laughs> but if you bake it in from the beginning, then you're gonna have a really great uh, muffin. And that's how she was uh, using that metaphor for accessibility, you gotta bake it in from the beginning. Uh, things like localization and internationalization, uh, things like cultural significance for color, um, text expansion, um, even how words are capitalized. Like some people will use CSS to capitalize or um, change the uh, capitalization of words, but you could actually affect the understanding in another area. So I mentioned color, so for in the US, when we look at stocks, we usually use red to indicate that the stock is going down and green to indicate the stock is going up. But in a lot of Asian countries, red is actually a symbol for luck and prosperity. So in their applications, they're gonna use red to indicate the stock is going up versus green for down. Uh, Anna Pickard, who works at Slack, is the editorial content director, um, and she also gave a talk um, at that conference, and I loved what she said about using puns. Like, if you're trying to have a very fun, engaging UI, the thing about puns is that um, it relies on a cultural understanding. So it might make sense to some people, and they'll get it and they'll laugh, but other people won't get it and they'll feel excluded. So there's all these con uh, considerations to take into account. And then, um, especially our world of enterprise, we have things like allowing the customer to brand and theme the UI, uh, admins to configure where certain things go, what uh, navigation items are seen, um, our partner community is using our tools, our open source community are using our tools, so there's all these different excuse me, constraints and things that we have to consider. So um, back in September, uh, Nathan Curtis, who I mentioned earlier, wrote this fantastic article called Team Models for Scaling a Design System. And he goes through the different models that he's observed at different companies that he's worked with. Uh, the first one is what he calls the solitary model, which is like the overlord. And, but it's really more about their uh, roadmap and their workflow. The second model is what he called centralized, which is a centralized design team, uh, which produces, supports it um, as part of their job, and they're kind of like in service of the rest of the organization. And the third model is known as federated, in which designers from multiple product teams uh, decide on the system together and uh, work on it together. At the end of the article, he asked, um, I would really love to know like, how your organization or your company does it, so please let me know. And so um, in true medium fashion, um, I wrote a response article, uh, which I called the Salesforce team model for scaling a design system. Uh, but I wasn't really introducing a brand new model. Um, it really was a merging of the last two models that I mentioned. And I refer to it as a cyclical team model. Um, so this is where we have the centralized team uh, that uh, works on the system, but we also have federated contributors throughout the organization that collaborate with us. And it's cyclical because through this pairing model that we have, our design system is informing our product design throughout uh, our organization, but then they're out in the trenches doing their own research. They know their feature areas really, really well, so they, in turn, inform the design system. So it's this very cyclical model. It's much better than just being like in service of the company or like dictators. Like it's a more collaborative pairing model. So the centralized design systems team, which I'm on, uh, is really important for us. Um, I believe that even the best automated systems still need human guidance to succeed and survive. So our team sort of acts as like a librarian, distributor, facilitator. We make sure it's maintained and crafted with quality. And our current uh, team uh, breakdown, we have the overall Lightning Design System team. Um, we have my team, which is called Design Systems. 
This includes our creative director, design systems director, visual and interaction designers, and CSS framework developers. And then we have a sister team, which we refer to as um, oops, one more. Uh, design systems ops. So this is the team that's focusing on things like testing and automation and linting and distribution and all that, um, which is really important. And I'm going to go into a little bit more about that in, uh, later on. We also have our accessibility team. Uh, this team used to be separate from our team. And historically, our tests that would get flagged would happen towards the end when things are about to go into production. And there's this whole like testing blitz that has to happen. Uh, we moved the accessibility team um, under our umbrella. And now this happens at the beginning of the cycle instead of the end of the cycle. Because as I mentioned, it's important to bake it in from the beginning. So it's really great because they can like work with us to make sure that the code we're writing is proper and uh, semantic and accessible. Um, very much like the, the previous talk, which I thought was awesome. And then we have a prototyping team. And this team uh, consumes what we create and like rapidly prototypes and tests designs that the designers are creating. And then we have our federated design systems contributors. Uh, and these are distributed throughout the organization. They help keep the design system honest, accurate, useful, because it's really solving the problems that they have. So uh, this federated team is made up of our, our product and our platform designers, our user researchers. Uh, we have what we call embedded UX engineers. And these are additional prototypers that um, kind of dotted line report under these teams, even though they're um, also reporting to us. So they can kind of help make sure that the system, the design system is being used and um, people are using our patterns. Um, our production engineers, these are the actual engineers working on our code of our actual product that goes out. And things like doc writers, localization, and so on. So we have all these people from across the organization that uh, contribute and collaborate with us. So that was the team model. Um, the next initial thing that I think is really important, especially if you're not starting from scratch, you're trying to implement a design system for a product that already exists, is to conduct a UI inventory. You audit your UI, uh, UI, you categorize everything by the different types of components um, and their variants. So these are things like collecting all sorts of popovers and overlays, uh, tab sets, um, things like indicators, which are like showing a state of something or something loading or the progress of something. Uh, you collect all these together, you group them, and then you can standardize and consolidate. And it's important to take copious component notes. So this is you know, all the things like, you know, what are the responsive behaviors of that comp component? What are all the variants? What are all the states? What are the keyboard navigation requirements, the accessibility requirements, any other open-ended questions? Who are the people involved working on this thing? Uh, a really great quote from my good friend Miriam Suzanne says, if you don't document something, it doesn't exist. So it's important to document that, because if you don't, it's just, it's just not going to happen. I also think people get really caught up on terminology, like, is this an element? Is this a component? Is this a region? Is this, it's, it's in, in my eyes of doing this UI inventory, it's really all components. You might have tiny components consumed by bigger components. It's all components. And then I think it's really important to mention what we like to call special snowflakes. Um, sometimes you're going to have something that just does not really need to be a component in the system. This could be like your very unique, always changing home page. Or maybe you have a very specific uh, component for a very um, time sensitive uh, feature that's out very, like very limited. It's not really being shared. Um, it's good to document those and keep, you know, be aware of those, but it doesn't really need to be in your UI library. So with all that knowledge that we've gathered, uh, we created our design guidelines. And obviously, these are things like color, type, um, icons. Um, our patterns were things like inter interaction patterns, navigation, when to use a modal, when to use a drop down, when to use um, you know, basically anything in our design system. So I see a lot of awesome style guides that come out. And they always show their like, beautiful color palette. And 
it's good to show that. It's good to see, like, okay, these are our brand colors. Um, but I think it's also important to indicate, like, how do you use color and when do you use these colors? So when do these colors get applied to visual messaging? Or how do you use color to show visual differentiation? How do you use color for visual hierarchy? And by having this documentation, we found that it's really awesome for when we hire new designers. Uh, they can get on board very quickly. Katie Basie, who's a designer that joined our Sales Cloud team, uh, wrote a Medium post of her own. And, and she talked about how design systems she has found helped her like onboard very quickly and hit the ground running as an interaction designer. And she said, freed from some of the daily tedium that can come with being a designer, I can shift the bulk of my time and energy to looking at the bigger picture. And so what she was meaning, like she doesn't have to think about how many pixels is this UI element from the right or from the top. Like how, what color is this supposed to be? Rather, instead, she's sketching user flows and thinking about navigation patterns and like what the feature is actually supposed to achieve. So sketching is also really important. Um, I love seeing designers just uh, take marker to paper and not think that they have to Photoshop something to pixel perfection right away. Uh, just thinking through, like, what is this feature supposed to do? And it allows our designers to focus on the right questions at the right time. Uh, Diana Mounter is a designer that works at GitHub, formerly of Etsy, and she wrote a series of presentations and articles called um, Empowering Designers to Code. And in that, what her recent article about empowering designers to code, she said, true collaboration isn't throwing designs over the wall. It's designers, engineers, and the rest of the team sharing the responsibility to build a quality product. So, empowering designers. It's really important um, if, if you can get your designers working much more efficiently, um, iterating, especially if you can get them in the browser, like, this is really awesome, not just for efficiency, but it, you know, if your designers understand like, how these features are really going to work, um, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> and empowering our developers. Um, um, you know, if you can provide scalable, responsive, accessible code at the beginning of the development cycle rather than uh, trying to push them towards it at the end, uh, it lets our developers focus more on like the logic and and you know those things conditionals and things that are supposed to happen rather than how things look. Uh, we also have a lot of platforms and devices that may or may not be web. Um, you know, I me mentioned a lot of stuff about um, web, but we also have tablets and phones and other things to consider. And as I mentioned before, a lot of products. So how do we maintain consistency across a massive organization? And how do we make future visual design changes faster? And in, I mentioned earlier that we have um, developers that are building in our ecosystem. We don't know what stacks they're on. They could be in Ruby, they could be in C, they could be in PHP, they could be in Node, they could be in all sorts of different stacks. So we need our design system to be agnostic to what they're doing and uh, minimize our dependencies so that our design system can be leveraged in more places. Uh, so for us, our single source of truth are what uh, we created and refer to called design tokens. And design tokens are starting to get used by some other organizations, uh, Target, uh, Walmart, um, Nathan Curtis, who I mentioned earlier, is starting to use it with his agency. Um, so I'm really excited to see this starting to take off. So design tokens are essentially like the, the subatomic elements of a design system. They're basically named entities that store design values. So if you're familiar with CSS preprocessors, uh, preprocessors or even um, you know, CSS variables, they're essentially variables. Um, but we use them in a way that helps us scale our design across not just the web, but also native applications. So these are everything from your typography styles, your color styles, shadows, spacing, sizing, animation durations, 
uh, Z indexes or Z indexes, depending on where you're from, uh, breakpoints, like all the things that like in CSS would come after the colon, uh, you could store as a design token. And our designers refer to these tokens in their specifications. So instead of specking that a button has 16 pixels of padding on the left and right, they say that it has spacing medium from left and right. And this way, the, their design system is, a, or their design specs are always accurate. And if we make any changes, uh, that will propagate through. This, we found this was like super awesome. Like, we have automated testing to check if uh, a color is not contrasted enough, like text color against a background. And before, we would have to notify like 30 different teams that they needed to change this color. And now, we change it on our end, and it propagates through the build system, and they just get that change for free. And the way we do, uh, do that is a tool called Theo that we open sourced. It's how we generate these design tokens. So the, the way that works is you have a JSON or a YAML file, depending on your choice, uh, and you store these design attributes that I mentioned before, and we then convert that to Lightning, which is our internal platform, SAS, Less, and Stylus, uh, JSON for iOS, XML for Android, our style guide is generated off of it, and we even generate color swatches for Photoshop and Sketch users within the organization. And this is just a continuous integration environment, so as we make these changes, they come to the developers for free. So an example of what that looks like in the top left, uh, sorry, I'm running out of time. I'm going to hurry. Uh, we have our JSON file, which names and names the token, gives it a value, give it a comment if you need on usage guidelines. On the top right, you see SAS, um, the version of that. In the bottom, you see our Lightning version, which is what we use internally. And we take into account things like um, what do those color formats need to be for each of these platforms, like eight-digit hex for Android versus RGBA. Uh, things like dimensions, uh, you know, using uh, Android's uh, density independent units versus using REMS or M's for CSS. So um, you can go to our, our documentation later to see what our tokens are. So I'm going to just go right through that, and here's the swatches. Um, so in naming these tokens, we found semantics definitely matter. We use a generic to specific pattern. So we, cat uh, we start it with the category prefix, which is like color text or color background. Where is this token used on a button? Uh, what, is this a variant of a button, like button secondary? Um, or states, like hover, um, and things like maybe this is an inverse button on a dark background. So we name them all in a very contextual way so we know um, how these tokens are used. And then if you have common things that are shared, like maybe you have multiple uses of the same blue, we create what we call aliases. So here's where we name presentationally what our um, tokens are. And then the semantically named tokens will reference the uh, presentational aliases. So we store it in a very raw format where it's all caps and underscored. But then we can, Theo will convert to hyphenated and, and lowercase for SAS. Less, and then like Aura uses camel case for very specific reasons, so it can like do that format for you. Um, so basically, anything that's before the colon, like any CSS property, like that is something that you could consider a category for your tokens. Um, so I'm gonna go through these real quick for time's sake. Um, as I mentioned, these will be available later. So the important thing is that we have no more hard-coded values. Uh, if you want to check Theo out and contribute back or give us feedback, uh, you can go to our GitHub. Um, and um, let me s see. I've got. So for a CSS frame framework, we felt it was very important to keep, just be very lean about it. Only build things when we need it. Don't build a kitchen sink framework if you're only going to use like three things in that framework. And you might have not noticed I mentioned tokens, icons, HTML, CSS but I didn't mention JavaScript. And this was a very conscious decision because we have to be agnostic, and we have developers using Lightning, React, Angular, jQuery, and so on. And so what we do instead on our end is we rely on our information architecture and documentation to demonstrate what the outcome should be, and then let the 
developers use the framework that makes sense for their environment. When we show a component in the code for that documentation, on the, the right, we have states and variants. And so we can say, OK, I want to see what the focus version of this is. And we change out the example to show the focus version. And um, as you can see here, and then we also change the code. So you can see, OK, I need to use JavaScript to swap these classes out. Um, and then underneath, we go into more detail if you have any like ARIA roles or like tab index changes or anything like that that needs to happen. Um, and any other JavaScript or accessibility needs, we put in the overview um, underneath that component. Uh, we have to be forward thinking while being backward compatible. I'm sorry I'm going over. <laughs> we always, because of the nature of our work, we have to support three versions at the same time because uh, we release three times a year, uh, which for small companies that seems slow, but for big enterprise companies that's actually really fast. Uh, so we're always supporting our current production release, which is what you see now. Um, we always support our previous release because we don't want to leave any of our developers behind. And we have to support our future releases. Um, so a thing that comes up a lot with this is deprecation. Um, so it's a very common technique in software development. Uh, we always flag our components if they're deprecated so people know. Um, but that also requires a lot of um, you know, reading the manual to know. And we were also thinking we would just comment, like, to do, remove this in version blah, blah, blah. It's not really maintainable. Um, so we created another open source tool called SAS Deprecate, because we use SAS on our, our team. Um, since we're using SAS, why not use that um, for what it's good at? So the way we do that is we store a variable called um, app version. We say, this is the version we're on right now. And then we store a variable of a future version. This is where you want the code to deprecate. And then you can also add a message, which is like, this is deprecated because of such and such. Use this instead. So in version one, you might have a button icon. Um, and then in version two, you might decide, you know, I'm going to deprecate this because it's no longer necessary. So you wrap it in that mix-in. You say, deprecate this in version three. And here's the comment people will see instead. And then once you hit version three, um, that code will no longer compile. Um, and you'll get, we have tests running to let you know ahead of time, like, hey, you're using deprecated classes. And the great thing about this is if you don't do this, like, um, CSS can kind of just grow and grow and grow as you move on, because you deprecate things, but you don't really make the effort to remove it. Uh, by wrapping all your deprecated things, you kind of keep your CSS at a more maintainable level by just not outputting those things anymore once it hits the point that you want it to disappear. So that's also on our GitHub um, if you want to check it out. And then um, there's a design ops article where you can read about what design ops are. I'm running out of time. So um, when you get the slides later, go read the article. And it describes like how design ops basically um, help fidelity get to the user at a much higher quality. Um, and the important thing around design ops is like keeping things alive. So I see so many style guides get released and published, and then they just die a really slow and painful death. And I like to call these zombie style guides. It's really important to keep your style guides living. And a lot of this is done through automation. But I also think, again, as I mentioned before, human guidance is really important to really make things succeed and survive. And so as I mentioned, this is a product. Like, it's a product serving other products. Um, so that involves support. Any pro good product has good support. And so we support our adoption through education and consultation. Um, so we have what we refer to as advisory boards, like twice a week. Developers and designers can come meet with us and show their designs. We give them feedback, or they can ask us CSS questions. It's like our allotted time to help the organization keep this uh, going. And evangelizing this internally to not just your internal teammates, but if you have an external developer ecosystem, uh, evangelizing to those external partners. And of course, you always want to show things like metrics and like how things are are improving, like how many lines of CSS are getting deleted, how many uh, features are getting shipped faster because of this. 
uh, Claudina Sarai, who's uh, one of the core SAS team members, says patterns are not dogma. They can change and adapt. So as much as like, I like to make things very consistent and standard, I think a really good design system must be allowed to evolve and iterate. So don't be just like a dictator about it. Like be collaborative and allow people to contribute back. Um, I mentioned things are open source. You can check things out. Um, I think it's good to open source your design system and share. Um, if you're really into this kind of stuff, I have a Slack called Design Systems. You can go to designsystems.herokuapp.com and just automatically be invited. And next year, I will be doing another design systems conference for Clarity. Um, I'll post more details about that later. Thank you.